With that, let me now move into presentations from our distinguished panelists. Again, I want to introduce first Mr. Victor Good, who is Assistant General Counsel for the NAACP in Baltimore, Maryland. Victor. Good afternoon. Congressman Hinojosa mentioned that when he was attending school in McAllen, Texas, he attended a segregated school. Well, I didn't realize that he was from McAllen because that's where I was born. And in fact, my father was a principal of one of those segregated schools in McAllen. He was the principal of the segregated black school. And when the district finally decided to desegregate the students, there was no room for a black principal, so we had to go, and we did with that. Last December, we testified with MALDEF at a U.S. Commission on Civil Rights briefing entitled The Over-Inclusion of Ethnic and Racial Minorities and English Language Learners in Special Ed. One of the things we noted was that the state of Rhode Island had made certain promises to the U.S. Department of Education. One of those promises was to continue its work in providing guidance and professional development to the districts in Rhode Island on best practices for both identifying and for instructing English language learners who also happen to have disabilities. The state of Rhode Island also promised the U.S. Department of Education that it would begin to incorporate district-level disproportionality analyses in its monitoring system. We mentioned the state of Rhode Island only because it was one, of, one example, and there are states across the country that are facing the same challenge. The issue of appropriate tests for English language learners exists not only in the context of high stakes proficiency tests. It's also an issue for English language learners whom we suspect have a disability that interferes with their ability to learn. These students require assessments as part of the IDEA's child find requirement or as part of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act or the American with Disability Act requirement to reasonably accommodate. Both require culturally competent testing to ensure that we're measuring the disability and not the student's competence in English. Now, if we're in a jurisdiction with a substantial number of a particular language minority students, we're probably in a stronger advocacy position. But if we're in a jurisdiction where our language minority clients or constituents are relatively small in number, God help us, and he will. But besides the moral rightness of our advocacy, it's probably a very smart idea to also understand Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as where to find an expert who can help us with that culturally competent assessment. Now, I know this is a NCLB briefing, but is there anyone in this room who doesn't have a student English language learner, client or constituent, who also requires services from the mental health system? So we fight these battles for culturally competent services both in the education system and in the mental health system. 